Okay, so I kind of geared this talk this evening towards mushroom growing in an urban setting. This is quite conducive to people that are new to mushroom growing, um, as opposed to more on the agricultural scale, which doesn't typically apply to a lot of beginner growers. Um, there are a lot of varieties of mushrooms to cultivate, and so we're going to kind of go over a lot of different ways to grow and the varieties that can be grown. So I always like to start with this screen because it just kind of dazzles with all the colors and the textures and flavors. Um, but it's kind of an introduction to just that wide variety of mushrooms that are out there um, that not only can be cultivated, but are delicious and healthy for us. So um, in terms of growing, um, there are a lot of different ways to cultivate. And you know, one of the, the differences there is the material that you're actually going to be growing on and where the mushrooms are being grown. Uh, whether that's indoor or outdoor, we're gonna kind of discuss all the materials um, that would be needed. And you can find that some of the varieties that you can cultivate can be grown very easily on materials that you probably already have access to. All right, so I like to kind of go over um, just a general overview of the different fungal foods. Um, I've already kind of alluded to all these different materials that can be used to grow mushrooms, um, but I also have a few photos just to kind of demonstrate that. Um, on the right, we have oyster mushrooms growing on logs, uh, oyster mushrooms growing on straw packed into a bag here, oyster mushrooms on sawdust blocks, compost bed mushrooms like the almond, a wine cap growing here on wood chips and straw. And here's oyster mushrooms growing on a toilet paper roll, an egg carton, and even a pair of jeans. So obviously what we're gonna be covering tonight is the more typical cultivation strategies, but you know, all of these bizarre materials like denim jeans and paper and toilet paper, those are all, you know, plant-based materials. Essentially fungi can break down and digest a lot of really fibrous planty materials. Um, obviously some cultivation strategies, you know, growing on jeans is not going to yield the most mushrooms, but it's certainly an interesting topic for kind of recycling some materials. So um, one of the terms that I'll be using tonight is spawn. And Field and Forest, the company that I work for, um, primarily sells mushroom spawn, which is essentially this a fancy word for mushroom seed. Um, spawn basically has the root structure or the mycelium of fungi um, that you plant in whatever material. And so that's something that a company um, would probably provide to you. And essentially, usually that would come with instructions. Um, and that's what we'll be going through tonight is how to use the spawn once you acquire it. So the three mushrooms that I like to start off with um, are the garden mushrooms. These three are probably the most approachable for the typical homeowner. Um, they're grown right on the ground outside on a variety of materials and they can be planted really easy without any tools. The first one and our top seller and still our favorite is by far the wine cap mushroom. Um, it has a button-like appearance. If you allow it to grow, it even kind of opens up into a portobello shaped mushroom. Um, it grows on wood chips or straw or a combination of the two. And a lot of times people already have spaces in their landscape that they add mulching material, whether that's straw or wood chips. Um, but essentially, if you're already adding those sorts of materials, um, you can add a single step and um, sprinkle some spawn in there and grow one of these really wonderful mushrooms. Um, and typically a bed planted with this wine cap mushroom can fruit anywhere from one to three years, typically two to three. So I already kind of alluded to its taste, um, definitely like asparagus or broccoli for some. Um, and you can 
cook it right up with those vegetables. Um, we have a nice grill pan at our house. We like to just sprinkle some olive oil and mix the vegetables in there and that works really well. Um, shish kebabs, you can saute with eggs. It's a really mild mushroom, so it can be incorporated into a lot of things. Again, making it kind of a nice starter mushroom. Um, it definitely prefers shady areas or partial shade. Um, essentially what you're gonna hear tonight from me is a lot about moisture management. Um, before the talk started this evening, we were kind of were talking about wild mushrooms and how oftentimes, you know, you can go to a spot and see a lot of mushrooms and sometimes not so many. And that really comes down to rainfall and temperature and season. And so what you'll find with a lot of these is if you select an area to grow mushrooms that's shaded where it can receive natural rainfall, um, mushroom growing can be really passive, essentially just plant it and forget it check occasionally for mushrooms. So um, just to go through the process of planting one of these wine cap beds, um, if you were to use straw, which is a really nice substrate because it colonizes quickly um, and produces a lot of mushrooms, typically within two to three months after planting. Um, try to get good, clean straw. Wheat or oat is preferred. And that first step then is to soak the straw. And you wanna soak it so it softens up that woody straw um, and kind of lightly ferments it just to prepare that for the wine cap mushroom. Usually soaking is about two to six days. Um, and we like to do it in these large tubs, but depending on the amount of material you're soaking, even, um, just a plastic bin from the basement or something would work more than fine. Uh, the next step then is to drain it um, of any of the excess water, typically just an hour or so before you're gonna build your bed. And then selecting a nice bed location. Again, shaded areas are really ideal and you just sprinkle the straw and the spawn in layers, kind of just build it up in layers um, right on the ground. So I'm gonna show you a picture on the left here um, during one of our workshops, we have kind of this area on the premises um, that it, we have some larger conifer trees and the grass doesn't really grow well under there. It's hard to mow because of um, pine cones and that sort of thing. And so that's a great space to just lay down some mulch um, and grow mushrooms. So you can see kind of some dappled shade here. And essentially what we're doing is transferring straw from the soap tank right on the ground and then sprinkling spawn in. And then you can see just a slightly different angle. Um, the photo on the right, you can already see mushrooms popping up just later that season. Um, here's another uh, space. This one is actually in my backyard here in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, we live in a really residential area, so we don't have a lot of land to ourselves, um, but we kind of have a small fenced in garden space and a chain link fence um, at the back border of our property. And there's kind of this narrow little area between those two spaces that's difficult to mow. It's kind of low. We have a lot of creeping Charlie. Um, so that's just a space that we spread out some old straw from the Halloween before the, this, the fall season. We kind of had some hay bales or straw bales uh, as decoration outside. So we utilize that. And you can see in the middle photo, just a few months later, those mushrooms are already starting to crop up. Um, and the photo on the right is just one of the harvests that I had later that season. So, um, and in that photo, you can see a few of the mushrooms that opened up to produce um, more of the portabella shape. And then a few in the middle, there are more the, the button form. Um, so they can be harvested at any stage, depending on your usage. Um, but again, just a, such a small uh, underutilized space can really be productive if you wanna get into mushroom growing. So in terms of using wood chips, um, it's great if you can use both. Um, straw is fast to colonize and it can produce a lot of mushrooms quickly, but it also breaks down quite quickly. So um, wood chips are somewhat opposite. They're a denser food resource. And so they can produce mushrooms for two to three years. So oftentimes what we like to recommend is if you have access to both, use both. Um, that way you're getting kind of the speed of the straw and the longevity of the chips. Um, and in terms of getting chips, a lot of our customers kind of reach out to tree trimming services. Um, 
or uh, the local municipality oftentimes has uh, wood chips usually for free, that would work just fine. The biggest rule of thumb is making sure you can avoid some of those soft woods like pine or conifers. Um, and that can be hard to do sometimes, but if there are multiple piles, just grab a handful and smell it. And if it smells strongly of pine, probably avoid that or just use it as the top layer above that straw. Um, so I just wanted to show a few customer photos um, of wood chip beds. Uh, the one on the left is still one of my favorites. It's an older photo of one of our customers. Obviously, he's harvesting a lot of wine cap there, but one of my favorite aspects of this photo is that black lab. Um, I'm just really partial to black labs. And then the photo on the right is kind of more of a, a landscaping uh, area outside of a business. Again, they were just layering down wood chips annually to keep it nice looking. And you can see all of those mushrooms just kind of fruiting in and amongst those. So it was a good use of space where they were already laying down that, that mushroom material. material. And then here, this is right outside of uh, the farm home on our premises. Again, you know, laying down wood chips and you can see quite a good harvest here of the wine cab. So one of the other benefits that I like to mention when you're growing mushrooms is you can use those underutilized spaces, but the bed itself can really help kind of reduce um, weeds or suppress weeds. So one of the common places where we lay mulch is around orchard trees or other things where we, we wanna keep down um, you know, weeds and that sort of thing. So here we just have a photo of some cardboard just down on the ground around one of our apple trees. And the cardboard layer itself, um, we, we obviously as a business have a lot of this excess material, um, just kind of flatten it out, lay it down right onto the, the bare soil or on top of turf grass, and then start building your bed on top of that. It's quite impressive how quickly that cardboard breaks down. It's two to three months later and the soil microorganisms along with the wine cap immediately start breaking down that material. So, you know, I'd suggest taking off the tape that oftentimes is there because that's about the only thing that'll be remaining just a few months later. And I have a few examples of how good that can, can really help just by adding that extra layer of cardboard there. Um, you know, one of the places that we like to put a wine cap bed is right under those beehives, um, because certainly no one wants to weed whack around the beehives in the middle of summer. So this is a nice way to kind of keep down the grass surrounding that. And then the photo on the right is our new facility several years ago when we built it, um, had a lot of just goldenrod and other things. And we just kind of wanted to freshen up just adjacent and around the building. And so here's an example of a wine cap bed um, right outside. And you can see a few weeds coming through, but for the most part, um, it's a really good demonstration of how easily you can cultivate mushrooms and use that to also suppress weeds. One other thing I wanted to point out with that photo in particular is that the mushrooms in the bed on the right are grown in full sun. And so, you know, I mentioned um, cultivating and dappled shade to full shade is ideal. You can grow mushrooms in full sun, but what you can see on those caps, the mushroom caps, is that they're a little dry and leathery and can even crack once they kind of are exposed to the sun and the wind. Um, still perfectly edible. Um, I just like to point that. Out. So then the next mushroom variety is grown fairly similar in that it's a bed grown variety, um, but this is the almond portobello mushroom. So it's a very similar. Um, it's a sister species to the one that we can find in the grocery store, the white button or the portobello. Um, it's similarly grown on compost as opposed to the wood chips and straw. So this one you would need compost. Again, um, we've tested all sorts of composts, including bagged compost that you can get in the store or um, local municipalities oftentimes have access to, to free compost, um, which can also be incredibly useful. Um, this is the only mushroom variety that, that is an animal the cell, um, it's a tropical species used for cultivation. And so unfortunately this far north, even where you guys are located, um, it just doesn't really survive our long winters. Uh, but what it 
loses there, it definitely makes up for speed of colonization and productivity, as you'll see in some of our pictures. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So um, because it's a single season and it thrives under warm conditions, um, we oftentimes choose to plant this one along our tomato plants in a high tunnel or a hoop house. Um, greenhouses, even cold frames, all sorts of um, spaces like that can really extend the season, especially for one like this, where you're just trying to capitalize really from June to September. Um, this one is just as easy to plant. Um, you want to use finished compost. You can see in the photo here, um, two different types of compost. Again, we've tested them all, very productive. The biggest variable is just making sure that that compost or that bed stays nice and watered. So what we've done in our greenhouse is we like to grow multiple crops in the same space. We have tomato plants, the compost, which can really feed and add nitrogen to that soil and the tomatoes really thrive. And then you can see in the right, we're planting basically chunks of that spawn into that um, compost material. It takes only a few weeks and the spawn or the mycelium will spread through that entire bed and begin to fruit. Um, in terms of managing moisture, you wanna make sure that there's some sort of irrigation or if this is a bed just outside in your backyard that you're spraying it down with a hose or using a watering can. Um, a lot of times we like to mulch or even cover, again, we're using more cardboard here um, just to use it because it's a part of our business. But uh, really the name of the game is just keeping that bed moist at least for the first few weeks while that, that mushroom spreads. And I promise quick, usually about a month later, you're starting to get your first flushes and they grow in these beautiful clusters um, right from that compost bed. Um, you can see in both of these photos, we've elected to kind of mulch it in with some straw to help with that moisture. Um, and it just thrives right at the base of those tomato plants, which usually can also provide some shade and that sort of thing in the, the growing area. Um, you know, I've shown photos of us cultivating in a greenhouse, but it really is as simple as a compost heap outside or even containers. Um, the photo on the left is a compost bin that we have back by our garden that I just threw extra spawn into. And you can see mushrooms kind of cropping up just to the left of that bin. So it can be applied to any other which way, um, including pots, which is one of my new favorite things. Um, we cultivate a lot of our tomatoes and peppers into pots because our garden space at home is very shaded. Um, and right to that uh, potting soil, you can add you know, a handful of spawn and get mushrooms uh, in those pots. Here's a few other um, cilantro and tomatoes and even peppers that we've done that with. And even our window boxes at work. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so the last of the garden mushrooms that I like to bring up is uh, the bluet mushroom. Um, and one of the earlier questions prior to us starting was um, whether we were gonna discuss tonight harvesting mushrooms from the wild. And that could be a whole nother talk. Um, so unfortunately, there's not much of that in here, but the bluet for anyone that has harvested from the wild is a mushroom that's grown in Wisconsin and Illinois, especially in the fall. Um, so this one is kind of a, a meteor mushroom, um, nice and lilac colored. It kind of has nice woodsy earthy taste to it. And you can cultivate that on a mix of materials, again, in a bed form. And that typically fruits mushrooms for two to three years if you plant that. Here's a photo of um, one of our harvested mushrooms and you can see the materials that it's growing on. It's really a, a mix of things. So any of you that are you know, collecting leaves now in the fall, if you're going to pile them up with grass clippings and twigs and bark and pine needles, Really the greater the mix along with some compost, um, pile it up, put some spawn in there. And that's a good mix for this bluet. 
Um, again, really any of these garden mushrooms, but bluet in particular, work really well with planting. If you're already planting, um, you know, squash or some of those fall harvest plants, the leaves from those vines can provide the shade for the mushroom bed below. And that compost and that rich material that you're cultivating the mushroom on can really add to that soil beneath. And so so um, at Field and Forest, we really like to polyculture or grow multiple crops together. And that's a nice way to kind of utilize the space as well. So here's just another cluster of bluet mushrooms kind of popping up from that mulched in compost. Um, Pepper here is our farm cat. So she kind of comes along with us when we harvest. Um, you can see uh, just the timing. We've got some wine cap there. Um, but really, it's just an excuse to show Pepper our farm cat. <laughs> I've already kind of alluded to some of the benefits of polyculturing. Um, but one of, the, you know, really this topic um, is important to me because it's one of the main focuses of some of the research that I've been doing at Field and Forest and actually quantifying the benefits of culturing and growing mushrooms alongside other plants. Um, and we've recently acquired a grant through SARE, the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, um, for investigating this and actually looking into it. So I just kind of wanted to share um, a photo of what we're doing. Uh, we're working specifically with tomato plants. Um, and you can see here is a straw bed with a wine cap mushroom. You can even see some of the mushrooms fruiting around the border of that bed. And essentially what we've discovered already in the two years that we've done this study is that the soil beneath is healthier. The tomato plants cultivated with this fungi are healthier, they're larger, they're more resistant, more resistant to disease. They also produce more tomatoes, so they yield almost twice as many tomatoes as plots with just straw and no mushroom. Um, and one of the more interesting things is we're actually trying to quantify um, an antioxidant called ergothionine that is a special antioxidant in our diet that apparently only comes from the microorganisms in the soil. And so the healthier the soil, the more microorganisms, the healthier the food we can grow from that soil. And so that's kind of this new level or layer that we're investigating. Um, we obviously love growing mushrooms, we love eating mushrooms, but if we can also quantify all these other benefits of mushrooms, that kind of really excites us. So, um, and here's just a, a graph showing uh, the average health of those tomato plants are about twice as healthy when cultivated alongside those mushrooms. So that was it for the garden mushrooms. Um, again, those are a really nice introduction, but oftentimes people um, also have access to fresh cut logs and log-based mushroom cultivation is a long-term thing. Um, so we talked about how those beds can produce mushrooms anywhere from one to three years. Uh, the average shiitake log, if cultivated on oak, can fruit mushrooms for up to eight years even 10 years. Um, so if you have access to wood, there's a lot of wonderful mushroom varieties that can be grown on that. One of the, the caveats to this is that um, the log quality definitely matters. So you wanna make sure that the, the trees or the logs you're growing on are healthy and living at the time of cutting. Um, any tree that's already showing signs of disease has probably already been Ill, infiltrated by some um, disease causing fungus. And um, another important aspect is when you cut your logs, it can be even better if you wait until after those leaves fall off on, fall off in the fall. Um, that means that the tree has kind of pulled those nutrients down and kind of the quality of the wood is much better. So um, this chart is small, but we have it on our website as well. Essentially that last element is that the type of tree matters. So when it comes to most of these mushroom species, they are cultivated on hardwood logs. Um, shiitake, for example, prefers some of those harder hardwoods like oak, sugar maple, ironwood, um, beech, whereas the oyster uh, can be cultivated on some of the weedier, softer hardwood tree species like cottonwood, box elder, uh, willow, and some of those. 
So, um, you know, if you have any questions or um, want to reference this chart, it's certainly on our website and elsewhere on the internet. But just make sure you're kind of checking what type of wood, because sometimes that can tell you what type of mushroom you can cultivate. So when you get into log inoculation or growing on, on logs, there are kind of two basic methods. We're going to start with the drill and fill method, and then we'll also talk about the, the totem method. So the drill and fill is that diagram on the left. Typically now you're using longer, narrower logs, usually three to eight inches in diameter and about three feet long. Um, and then essentially what you're doing is drilling holes all the way around that log. And I have a, a basic setup and we'll go through just a few pictures of how that's actually done. So you're drilling holes around the circumference of that log and then filling with mushroom spawn and sealing. Um, in the bottom photo, we have a picture of one of our plug spawn varieties. All you need to do there is line up this wooden dowel that we've already kind of inoculated with the mushroom, hammer it in and seal with wax. On the top right, there are tools that can kind of inject and kind of speed up the process of the spawn into the holes, but essentially the same concept. Um, this next slide has a photo of our more traditional layout. We have Joe, the owner of Field and Forest on the end. He's operating the drill, drilling those holes. And then the two in the middle have tools basically injecting or inoculating the spawn into the logs. And then Phoebe there on the end is just sealing each of those holes with wax. Um, some of our tools can skip that step and actually just seal with a styrofoam cap, depending on how many logs and what you're working with. When it comes to the totem method, now this is typically done with larger diameter logs. So again, it kind of depends on, you know, what materials you have or what variety you're doing. Um, but the concept, instead of drilling holes, is you sandwich that spawn between the layers. Um, so in this diagram, we just kind of show a large container or trash bag or plastic bag of some sort. Layer spawn, put a section of log, another layer of spawn, another section of log up until about as high as that bag, and then you close it up and keep that in there. Um, the bag itself will keep that humidity high and there's no need for wax. We have a picture here of Joe on the right. Um, he's building a totem there um, right inside the bag. You can see the bag of sawdust spawn um, and essentially just layering it in between those cut sections of the log. So after you've done all of this, uh, the next step is what we call incubation. And this is when that mushroom mycelium is spreading throughout the entirety of that log. Um, a good space is low to the ground where that humidity is high and out of the sun where it can receive rainfall. So you can see this photo here on the left. Um, we just kind of return them to the woods surrounding our area. You can stack them to use up less space. Um, but the totem is a nice option for you know, people in the city because it uses space more vertically. And you can see how it's kind of contained into this bag. So that's a process that could be done year round, essentially. So one of the most popular varieties for cultivating on logs is the shiitake mushroom. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have even tried shiitake. It's one of those specialty mushrooms that's kind of found itself in, you know, in more mainstream now, probably because it's rich, garlicky, earthy flavor. It's a really meaty mushroom. So if you haven't tried shiitake, I'd really suggest it, especially if you like garlic. Um, but it also is one of our most productive mushroom varieties. It's cultivated on some of those harder hardwoods like oak, sugar maple, ironwood. Um, and it's really a wonderful one to start with because it's fast and productive. I would say that oyster is another really nice one to start with because it's fast and productive. Um, as you can see with those photos here, um, there is a very wide variety of colors and that can come from different species. Um, they fruit at different times. So the, the golden one on the, the bottom middle, that's one of our warmer season varieties. So if you plant the golden oyster, that would typically fruit from logs during those warmer months, um, say July, August. 
um, those periods. And then obviously on the left, you can see that's in fall. That's kind of a moderately cool fruiting one. That's our Italian oyster. It's a little bit of a meatier one, um, but essentially all of these are using some of those softer hardwoods like box elder, cottonwood, willow, um, and some of those. Lion's mane and cone's tooth. Um, both of these have very similar species that are found in the wild. So again, if you're a forager, um, these are also a little easier to identify um, and very common to fruit in the fall season, especially when that temperature starts to drip, drop down. Um, it has a similar texture and flavor to that of shellfish. So a lot of times at market, um, we just kind of explain it that you can, you can cook it much like you would shellfish, like crab or lobster. So it's a really wonderful mushroom. Um, this is also kind of in the headlines in terms of using mushroom as medicine um, because there are compounds in lion's mane that have, are being investigated for helping with memory improvement and neural function and that sort of thing. So not only is it flavorful, but it may also have a lot of medicinal benefits too. And there are a few other varieties. I'll just kind of show a snapshot. Um, again, all of these log, log cultivated species are planted and grown much the same way. They just typically utilize different um, log types. So that's really that main difference there. Um, Namaco on the left kind of has this um, unique gelatinous covering when it's nice and young. Uh, this is the mushroom that's used in Japanese miso soup. And I believe it's the second top selling mushroom there in their um, culture. Um, it's not as popular in the US, but I swear if you can get past that sort of gelatinous appearance, it's a really wonderful mushroom. Um, quite similar is the chestnut there in the middle. A beautiful fall fruiting mushroom. It doesn't have that same coating as the Namaco does, um, but both of these kind of grow in these small clusters. And even after cooked, it remains really crunchy. So it has a beautiful texture to it as well. And then olive oysterling is another variety there on the right. It looks quite similar to the oyster, but it is a different species. Um, nice, meaty, firm texture, really great as like a meat substitute in some of those heavier fall dishes like a mushroom risotto. So up until this point, we've kind of focused on how to cultivate mushrooms outdoors. Um, but now I'd like to transition into some of the ways that we can grow mushrooms indoors. Um, you know, we talked a lot about moisture and selecting spaces where it's shaded and can receive rainfall. And that's the real benefit of cultivating outside is that mother nature can really take care of that for you. And so cultivating outside is a really passive thing. Um, um, the phone on the right is essentially the same thing. It's showing log incubation, but indoors. And when you take mushrooms indoors, you have to provide that humidity and a few other things. So you can see um, our customer here has not only watered these logs, but that tarp, that plastic sheeting is actually kind of draped over them most of the time just to keep it nice and humid. So here's a photo um, from one of our growing rooms. Uh, these are oyster mushrooms growing off of sawdust blocks. Um, essentially, you can see we're providing light, um, shelving space. Uh, you need to consider the appropriate temperature, but really that's anywhere from 50 to 75 degrees. Um, some varieties perform better on the warmer side. Some prefer some of those cooler temperatures, but household temperatures are acceptable for almost any mushroom variety. And then one of the things that's considered less is actually uh, providing fresh air. So um, mushrooms breathe oxygen in and release carbon dioxide out similar to us. And so usually there needs to be some sort of ventilation just to keep that oxygen kind of moving throughout that space. Otherwise, similar to plants without enough light, mushrooms can become quite leggy and then they have longer stems. And um, that's the last element is light. Um, and you can see we've become quite creative in this photo. We're even hanging strings of lights and Christmas lights and that sort of thing. So the type of light doesn't matter, but there needs to be some. Um, so a lot of growers, 
uh, have become quite uh, experimental with where to grow mushrooms, whether it's in a spare bathroom or in your basement, as one of our customers has kind of totally transformed their basement in that photo to the right. Um, but what I'm seeing a lot of now is that people have these small greenhouses. <laughs> Excuse me. And those can be transformed into kind of mini grow chambers, um, usually with some sort of humidifier hooked up and a lighting system can work just fine. So one of the ways to cultivate mushrooms inside is actually growing on straw in containers. It's really common to grow in these thick plastic tube bags, but um, I'll show you a few photos a little bit later with other um, you know, reusable buckets and that sort of thing. But this is a really common commercial method for cultivating oyster mushrooms because it's really fast. Typically, um, one and a half to three weeks after planting, you're already harvesting your first mushrooms. Um, and it doesn't utilize a lot of space. One of these bags in itself can produce multiple pounds of mushrooms, so it's quite productive as well. Uh, typically, the process is to acquire straw. Again, straw, not hay. Um, and then either heat pasteurize in water um, or use a hydrated lime soak. Essentially, again, you're hydrating that straw and treating it. And then basically planting or adding spawn to it and stuffing it into these containers or bags. You wanna poke the holes um, to allow breathing. And then later, as you can see in the photo on the right, um, those holes are also where those mushrooms will grow out of. And as promised, here are some kind of alternative containers that you can cultivate mushrooms in. Um, again, people have become quite creative and sometimes beautiful with that strawberry pot. But essentially the mushroom is just growing on the material stuffed inside, which is typically straw. And here's um, some customer photos of their grow room. Again, an interior space and some beautiful golden oysters and pohu oysters on the right. Um, and then one of the, the more common, especially for anyone that's kind of been at the farmer's market and, you know, or purchased a mushroom growing kit is actually mushrooms grown off of supplemented sawdust blocks. And again, there's a lot of varieties that can be grown this way. And this is usually one of the more easy methods um, because typically the producer, the spawn producer like Field and Forest or others will create this product and you simply take it home and open it up and then it fruits mushrooms. So it's also quite fast. Um, some varieties can fruit in as quick as seven days whereas some may take up to three weeks, but again, they can typically fruit multiple times as well. Um, the photo on top is the reishi mushroom on the left, that orange one. Uh, reishi is another really potent medicinal mushroom. Um, Hen of the woods just to the right of that or maitake, um, that's another one that's commonly sought after for um, harvesting outside, especially in the fall that grows at the base of oak trees. And then lion's mane there on the bottom we've already kind of touched on. Uh, here's a few photos of shiitake. Um, again, one of the more popular mushroom varieties, very easy to cultivate this way. And this is by far one of the fastest. Uh, usually you take this block out of the bag and within days, the mushrooms are already growing. So it's really exciting. And, you know, if you're looking to kind of try different mushroom varieties, this is really nice for market growers um, or experimenters or people that are just looking for a few mushrooms without a lot of work, or if you don't have access to straw or wood chips or logs. Um, the oyster blocks, again, a lot of varieties can be grown um, with these beautiful different colors. Um, oyster mushrooms are probably the second most popular specialty mushroom. And again, you know, some of you may have even spotted these in the grocery store. I can guarantee you that the homegrown ones are fresher and better. Um, but yeah, it's a, a tender, mild mushroom. So very approachable for people that are looking to try mushrooms, but not quite sure which one. This is a nice introductory one because it is quite mild. 
And then chestnut is probably one of our, our favorite, more recent ones. Again, this is that, that mushroom that maintains its crunch and it has a nice nutty flavor, um, grown equally well on blocks just like this. So one of the things tonight that I wanted to focus on is all the different ways you can grow. But I also wanna emphasize with even just a little space, you can grow mushrooms anywhere, whether that's in the bin in the basement, or if you lay down wood chips under your hammock somewhere, um, you can definitely incorporate mushrooms and you know, field and forest or a lot of different resources online are out there just to kind of help introduce you to this, this new thing. Um, I mentioned our website and having some nice resources. If you go there, it's fieldforest.net. And we have this learn tab that kind of talks about, you know, the different mushroom varieties, uh, different methods for growing. And then there's that section that has instruction sheets. If you want to know what you're getting into a step-by-step, -step, every single detail, you can check that out. But we also have some nice videos and, um, there's so much content on YouTube and, you know, online resources for getting into this. Um, but, you know, we're here to help and a lot of people are. So I encourage you to, to definitely give it a try or at least explore what your options are. All right. So I guess at this point, um, Kayla and Sue, we'd probably open it up for questions or, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. That was that was an amazing talk. Thank you so much. I um, I really appreciated your work on um, the the polyculture with the tomatoes. That was fascinating. Excellent. Yeah, it's definitely it remains one of our um, ongoing research projects. We've kind of been working on iterations of this project for years now, but um, it's it's definitely exciting stuff. And as much as we love growing and harvesting, we also like to quantify how else we're helping. So, yeah, absolutely. And actually, one of the questions in the chat was actually about that. Um, so they were saying, Sarah was saying that she actually had noticed random mushrooms were popping up in her tomato plants um, this year anyway. And so she wanted to know what um, should she be aware of if she wanted to purposefully plant mushrooms in the same raised bed. Um, and that raised bed right now, she's overwintering some garlic. So maybe there's a few, there's a few variables there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so it sounds like you have the right area to cultivate mushrooms in that space. In fact, you know, wild ones are already popping up. Um, that is something that we didn't really touch on is that, you know, any of those bed based mushrooms, the wine cap, the almond agaricus and the bluet, you know, you're growing on a material of mushroom substrate. And sometimes you can get these other varieties popping up. But uh, the three that we cultivate are easy to identify. So that's the things if you're going to plant mushrooms there, just make sure you're identifying what you're meant to grow, um, which can be easily done. But yeah, it sounds like um, we do have a lot of customers that utilize those raised beds. So essentially, you'd still have to add that material, whether it's the straw or wood chips or the compost to that. Um, but you can certainly add that right to that top layer of the soil in there. And, um, you know, native fungi, including the ones that um, she'd seen pop up there, can certainly add all those extra benefits to the soil. Um, but the cultivated ones are going to taste great. So, Awesome. So when it comes to, let's say, if you want to grow inside, I know you mentioned a bunch of different substrates. Um, straw was one of them. Chips was one of them. Um, is there, is there like a recommended blend of those two, or is it just kind of like, you know, um, I know you have all those resources on the website, so maybe it's just best to check the, re the resources first for the type, or is there like maybe just kind of a bit of a free for all? Yeah, when it comes to growing on straw or wood chips, um, there's really no perfect recipe. Um, and you can cultivate on straw alone or wood chips alone. Uh, we recommend if you can get access to both to use both because um, then you're getting the benefit of both. Um, really, the biggest thing is just been in mind moisture. And if it's a shaded area, you could get away with even a two to three inch deep bed if it's exposed to more sun, then we definitely recommend either a deeper bed or using wood chips because those don't dry out as much. Um, but there's really no, no magic recipe. It is as simple as just layering that stuff down there and adding mushroom spawn. Gotcha. 
Is there, um, and, I, and I'm not asking you to make recommendations per se, but is there um, a specific type of straw or specific areas to buy substrate that's better than others? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, depending on where you're located, that may be more or less readily available. Um, up here, a lot of farmers just outside the city are growing straw harvesting and you can, you know, purchase it. Um, at even the hardware stores, oftentimes, especially in the fall, it can be used as decoration, so it's available. Um, Easy Straw is another product, although more expensive, can also work on these with these applications. So depending on where you are, you may have to do some digging to figure out where to get the materials. Gotcha. There's actually a great question because we discussed this before um, the lecture, but can you grow moral mushrooms? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I cannot, and most people cannot, but I do know um, there are some researchers up in Northern Michigan that currently have a grant and it's top secret, um, but a lot of people are working on it right now. And I think that movement is getting close, um, but there seems to be some sort of interaction with morale mushrooms um, and the trees that they're growing near and that sort of thing. And a person that knows those morale spot, spots in the spring that checks every year, they know what they're looking for. Um, but in terms of cultivating, we just can't really replicate what's happening in nature well, but I think some researchers are getting really close. So... That's awesome. Um, to shift quickly to um, the the logs that you grow, yeah. um, when you inoculate, you know those logs is are they good for like one season? How many harvests are you able to get out of that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, for shiitake mushrooms, because they grow on some of those. Uh, harder hardwoods like oak or sugar maple or ironwood. Um, there's a lot of food resource in that dense wood. And so oftentimes, especially for us in the North, we can get eight years out of that mushroom log. Um, so from just the single planting, select a nice shaded area and typically that log will fruit as long as the bark stays on um, or mostly on. So for a lot of growers that can be eight, even 10 years. Um, I spoke and taught a workshop a couple of months ago. And one of the gentlemen there said he had one mushroom, but it was still one after 11 years. So um, it, when you look at the oyster mushrooms grown on box elder or sweet gum in the South, uh, that's less dense. And so typically you're looking at three to five years on some of those, but definitely multiple years. It's good to know. It's good to know. I was like, that's a lot of wood if you got to use it every year. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, Katie has a kind of a specific question. She's trying to grow cold blue oyster mushrooms on an inoculated log outside. They haven't fruited after almost two months. Um, do they fruit at a certain temperature? Is, is something, is it maybe something going wrong? Yeah. Um, so the, the drawback to log cultivation is that because it's a dense resource, it can take quite a while to colonize and be ready to fruit. So some of those bed mushrooms, as soon as a month to two or three months, um, when it comes time to log cultivation, sometimes it can be a full year before your log can produce their first mushrooms. Um, but once they do so, then they can fruit for multiple years. So um, it may be a couple of factors. Make sure that log is in a nice humid space, especially um, where there can be rainfall and that sort of thing. Uh, but if it's only a few months old, it's probably just not ready to fruit yet. And I would suspect that by next spring, it'll be closer to be, being able to do so. Gotcha, gotcha. So after you, you know, if you have one of those um, baskets with, you know, all the straw and you've harvest mushrooms for a while and, you know, maybe it's just not productive anymore. Um, what, what best to do with that leftover straw or all that leftover substrate? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we have huge compost piles at our farm. And um, so essentially what we do is we add all those materials um, to compost pile, kind of flip it a few times, not even high maintenance. 
Um, in the very following year, then we use that compost to grow the almond portobello and the bluet mushroom on that compost. Um, but mushroom compost is certainly a valuable commodity. So I'd suggest composting it if you can and, and spreading it on your garden or putting it in your pots or, or whatever you wanna do with it, but it breaks down quite quickly. So it's not too much of a nuisance. Nice, nice. Um, similar to the, the moral question, um, how are people discovering how to grow truffles? How to cultivate yeah. Them? Yeah, so um, that's another one that definitely has this mysterious life cycle in nature. And so cultivating it has definitely been a challenge. But I know there's an entire, you know, field of researchers working on that one as well. And I'm not as familiar with that as opposed to the, the morel, but I think there's multiple types of truffle and they're making progress on the, the United States cultivar one. So again, I think we're getting close. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, what about, oh, so another question about incorporating mushrooms into your, previ your previously existing landscape. Um, are there some more resources for that available anywhere? Yeah, we definitely have um, some videos on our website, um, but I would say specifically with wine cap, um, there is a plethora of videos out there um, with people that kind of show, you know, their specific area and just bed building and that sort of thing. But um, if you have any like site specific questions, uh, definitely give us a call or send us an email. A big part of what we do is talk to customers and how to adapt mushroom growing to really anywhere, so. That's awesome. And then one, okay, I have one last question in the chat um, and that is talking a little bit about um, wild mushrooms. Um, and I know you said this talk isn't about that so maybe we don't wanna to touch on this, but um, they were asking if we they could grow the wild mushrooms in their parkway where an elm tree used to grow. I would say that you know wild mushrooms um, the hypothesis that cultures are everywhere in the soil and that mushrooms pop up when the conditions are right. Um, so certainly, you know, as you're walking through the park or across the lawn, you can see things pop up and that just happens naturally, but um, you could also introduce mushrooms to a space, um, you know, whether that the tree that was mentioned is a viable substrate or you'd have to add something there, but you know, I can emphasize, you can grow almost anywhere. Um, the wild ones in all likelihood will just continue to fruit whenever the conditions are right for those. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions we had. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This was a great talk. I'm like really excited to grow mushrooms. I'm like, can I outfit this room? It's a time to put, <laughs> put tarps everywhere. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much. Um, yeah. so if anyone wants to kind of unmute and um, kind of hang out, we'll be here for a little bit. But thank yeah, you. That absolutely. was great. Yeah. Thank you. It's such I'd a like pleasure. To Thanks. I'd like to thank you for this great presentation. Your slides are gorgeous. You've inspired a lot of people to go out there and start looking at doing this. Excellent. So thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Growing mushrooms is a pretty easy sell. Um, to grow them is easy. Uh, they're really cool and it's new for most people. So um, my job is pretty simple to convince growers to try it. <laughs> well, well, thank you especially with like the polyculture, like it's, I mean, it, it's almost a no brainer. It's like, you can, especially if you're like a large scale grower, if you're growing tomatoes or potentially other things, I mean, that just could potentially significantly increase your revenue for, you know, space that's already there. And, and it really just makes sense. Yeah, we had um, at the Moza Organic Conference uh, several years ago, we had a berry farmer, um, if that's what you would call him. He came up and he said, every year we spread wood chips around the base of our berry bushes. Could I grow mushrooms there? And I was like, essentially, you're already making the bed. You just need the spawn. And it's a really great thing because he's already doing that, you know, as and a lot of people are already wood chipping uh, these landscape areas. And so it's really easy to just do one extra step and then get, you know, bountiful mushroom harvest, so. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've given us a great hour lecture. We really appreciate your time. We're gonna let you go now, unless somebody else has another question that they wanna ask real quickly. 
And we want to remind yeah, I you. Ask, I was Go going ahead. to ask what the cost of the spawn is. That's a good question. Um, so depending on what you're looking for, that could range anywhere from five dollars to 25 is the cost um, of our largest bag, just a single bag. Um, and the $25 would be spawn that would plant about 20 to 25 logs. Um, so spawn can be spread quite a long ways. So, and spawn can be put on bark and the straw too, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. So thank you again very much. And I wanna remind people that this recording will be posted on our website, probably in about a week or so. So you can go back and review it because you've covered a huge amount of material that I'm sure we'd all like to review. And mm -hmm. um, also that we have things coming up in the spring and or in the winter and the spring. So watch our website for that, popcon.org. Thank you again. Any other, if the rest of you wanna stay unmuted and can chit chat with each other, that's